Om Jnana Tamarandasya Jnana Shalakya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhumayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamstya He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dhinna Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastade Tapta Kanchana Koranghe Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Panchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So good evening to everyone. Welcome to the second part of this uh, second lesson on this uh, Bhagavad Gita Bhakti Shastri course. I want to begin here just to show you something which one devotee has written, compiled here on the 13th chapter because I, I was feeling in the last class one devotee was a little concerned anyway that uh, are you able to are you able to see this document oh no i have to open the just a minute <laughs> yeah share it yeah let me share it yeah okay okay now you can have it Yes, we can see my Right, so this is chapter 13, Viveka Yoga, right? And yeah. he's, he's, this is just a, a devotee giving a summary of the different chapters. So he wrote about the 13th chapter, I thought it was good for you to hear. He said, the, the final six chapters focus on transcendental wisdom, which helps one become detached from materialistic aspirations and be attached to Krishna. Chapter 13 covers topics previ previously discussed. This was the devotee, one devotee was a bit disappointed that, oh, we covered this before, I know the body and the soul. So, co covered topics previously discussed, but in this 13th chapter, Krishna is exploring them in a more analytical way. Thus, readers can take advantage of the logical presentation made by Krishna to strengthen their conviction 
and deepen their understanding. Right? And then he summarized what we covered yesterday, the first seven verses. Arjuna asked Krishna to define six subjects, nature, the enjoyer, the field of activities, nor of the field, knowledge, process of knowing, and the object of knowledge. These subjects are key constituents of Vedic philosophy, and Krishna therefore spends the entire chapter discussing them. Arjuna plays the part of a materially entangled person, so he can ask questions for the benefit of others. His inquiries create the opportunity for Krishna to offer answers to life's most profound mysteries. Okay, so I, I thought that it's very nicely written there. Uh, I wanted to go, what I want to do now is... Uh, sorry? Some question there? Everyone's okay with that? Yes. Okay, we're going to, I want to, now I want to, I'm going to give you a little exercise. I want to see how much you were able to absorb in the class, yes, on the last class. I want to test your memory bank or your understanding. So I've prepared a, a little exercise for you. I'll just show you. Well, I would prefer if you could type it, do you know? Is it possible? We could do it on chat? Oh, yeah. yeah, we can do it on chat, right? I, yeah, I prefer that. I, I, like you, I like them to get in the habit of uh, writing, putting down their answers and typing it out. Okay. Right? Okay. I, th I think it's more of an exercise for them because if we just let people answer, one or, one or two people will answer. I want everyone to have a chance to think about these okay. questions. Okay? So I've, I put here the review of lesson one, and there are three questions. Right? First of all, what's the difference between the two Shetragnas? And your answer can be very brief, you know, not, you don't have to elaborate, just very simple. And number two, explain the analogy of the king and the citizens. And then three, what evidence did Krishna use in his discussion of the duality of soul and super soul? I would like what you do, use chat and just type in answers, what you think would be the answers for these kind of these I'll just give you a few minutes to do this. Can you see the chat, Maharaj? Sorry? Can you see the chat? Yeah, uh, well, I have to open the chat, do I? Some monsters started pouring in. Okay. Yeah. Open the chat. Yes, ma'am. And and what about the questions? Can they can? can... Uh, questions will go actually. Yeah, but uh, they they're writing the answers. Yeah. They're writing the answers now. Oh, very good. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, very nice, yeah. Okay, this is just encouraging for me to see that 
you know, you're able to absorb these points. Yeah. Anybody, anybody got the answer for the third question? What does Krishna use for evidence? Remember the word, there's three authorities. So Krishna is one, <laughs> he's the guru, and then two more. The third question, yeah, someone's answered it, right. Yeah. Rishi B and, and then Chandu B. Rishi B, the, the great sages, and also Chandu B, the, the Vedic scriptures, particularly Vedanta Sutra. So this is Lord Krishna preaching, and in the course of his preaching, he's using authorities. Sadhu, Shastra and Guru, they are the authorities to establish conclusions. Okay, so thank you very much for participating in this little exercise. So we're going to go on now this evening. We're going to look at... Uh, Verses 8 to 12, right? We'll give you the review of that here. Oh, wait, sorry. First I have to click this one, right? Here we have Bhagavad Gita 8 to 12. These verses describe how the spirit soul can be free from the body by cultivating knowledge. Since true knowledge is revealed within the heart of a deserving person, the real method of acquiring knowledge is the cultivation of divine qualities, of which humility is foremost. Knowledge is not about information, but about exemplary personal character and practical behavior. One who cultivates a, sem a saintly character experiences a change of heart, which frees the soul from its identification with the body. Okay, so. So, very, very important for us to understand what's being presented here in the, this, this section, verses 8 to 12. Let me, you all have your Bhagavad Gita. You will notice the four verses are put together, and the, the four verses together comprise 20 different qualities which make up this process of knowledge. And the first two, Amanitvam Adambitvam, meaning humility and pridelessness. Very important qualities in cultivating the spiritual path. Now, Usually when we think of knowledge and, and by way of material education, as we get material education, we tend to become more proud. We become more infatuated with our learning. But 
the spiritual process is just the opposite. The more, the more we are advancing in the spiritual path, the more humble we should become. We lose that uh, pride. We have a saying, maybe you've had, pride comes before the fall. So we have to be careful not to be proud. Therefore, pridelessness is listed as one of the important qualities. Humility and pridelessness. Being humble. Lord Chaitanya has also stressed this for us. Let me close this door, this mic is a lot. With the, with the lockdown, the devotees are all in the ashram, so they have kirtan in the ashram every evening. Nobody, there's very few people, only a few pujaris in the temple room. So that's why you're hearing all this kirtan in the background. Jaipitaka Swami Maharaj told the devotees, must do kirtan three times a day. So morning, noon and evening, they have a kirtan in the ashram. Okay, so we're speaking about these two qualities, amanitvam, humility, and adamvitvam, pridelessness. Very interesting that they, they come first in the process of knowledge. That's a, the, like the, the beginning of the process of knowledge, that we have to be humble. Just like when you approach the spiritual teacher in Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, you've already studied the fourth chapter, verse 34, the process of acquiring knowledge. Tadvidi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya. Tadvidi pranipatena. So before we inquire from the spiritual teacher, the first thing we have to do is pranipatena. We have to fall down. We have to submit ourselves before Him. This is the process of acquiring transcendental knowledge. We have to give up our false pride, the illusion. That, and that false pride is coming because we are, we're thinking, I'm the body. And so, we can see that these transcendental qualities, this process of knowledge, it's not very easy to get people to actually realize or to understand that they're not the body. That's difficult for a lot of people. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya's process is made very easy. He said, just let everyone chant Hare Krishna. And by doing kirtan, by chanting the holy name, then the heart becomes purified and people do naturally become humble. Everything comes about through the chanting of the holy name, through the process of devotional service. Anyway, it's important for us to understand the significance of this uh, 20 items of knowledge and how the very first ones which Lord Krishna lives are being humble and giving up pride. As Lord Chaitanya says in the Shikshastikam, one should think of oneself lower than a straw in the street. So lower than the straw in the street means we should think of ourselves in terms of our spiritual identity. That we are one ten thousand, the tip of the hair, right? The spiritual dimension, the dimension of the soul is one ten thousand part of the tip of the hair. So we should have ego in proportion to that spiritual dimension. But because of illusion, because of pride, we identify with the material body. 
So we want to understand this process of knowledge. It's not just learning. The modern educational system is all, you go and you learn this and you learn that, and you learn things and then, then you forget them, you know, or the science changes, useless. But here in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is presenting the process of knowledge which never changes. This, this is the process of knowledge for time immemorial, since time immemorial. Does everyone remember how we define knowledge? What does knowledge actually mean? Knowledge means, someone like to tell me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, knowledge means uh, knowing about the field, uh, the soul and the super soul. The soul and the super soul. Anything else? Yes, and the uh, and the and relationship between the soul and the super soul. What is yeah, the constitutional position of the soul in context of the super soul? Yeah. Uh, that, and that should uh, that should encourage us or that should he does to act accordingly. So that constitutes the law. Uh -huh. Yes? I think the third one is the Shetra. Yes, right. Shetra also don't yeah. Yes, we should know about the field of activities, right. We should know about the field of... Knowledge means to know the field of activities and the knower of the field. There are two knowers of the field. Right? But we should know about the field of activity, meaning the body, and we should know also, as Maharaji said, the soul and the super soul, their relation. That is real knowledge. And if we cultivate this knowledge, then if we cultivate this knowledge properly, then naturally we'll come to the perfection of Krishna consciousness. We won't have to come back again in this material world. Oh, this, the real goal of knowledge is that. The real goal of knowledge, and earlier in Bhagavad Gita, how did Lord Krishna describe the goal of knowledge? Do you remember? Anybody? What, so, what's the goal? The goal of knowledge is to have pure, unalloyed, loving, devotional service for the Lord. Okay, I, I want a verse from the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna speaks about the goal of knowledge. Well, that's Paramatma vision, that verse. That's seeing with an equal vision. That is not the real ultimate goal of knowledge. There's a higher goal. No, you have you haven't got it yet. That's a nice verse, but it's not the one I'm thinking. There's an. I'll give you another verse, which I think when you hear it, yes. Can I say? Yes. Sarvasya chaham iti sangi vishto. I think so. That is the verse. Sarvasya chaham. No, it's not the one I'm thinking of. Generally, when we speak of the goal of knowledge. The verse is Bahunam Janmanamante Gyanavam Mam Prapajante Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudulava. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge understands that Vasudev Krishna is everything. Such a Mahatma, a great soul, is very rare. You see the specific reference to cultivating knowledge in that verse. Now, I want to ask you, by the process of knowledge, do we advance very quickly? Yes. No. Let's have a vote. 
Let's have a vote. How many people say yes? Put your lights on. Yes. How yes. many say no? Put your lights on. No, Maharaj. How many don't no. know? <laughs> Yes, it's not very it quick. Right huh? It should be the right knowledge. Well, the appropriate knowledge. Well, we're talking about the right knowledge, right? Yeah, definitely, it's the right knowledge. Once, once we have the knowledge, we'll automatically get the bhakti towards Krishna. So, knowledge is the first step, knowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, we have to hear. We speak more about hearing. We, we, de we definitely need to hear. We generally say, we begin the process of bhakti by hearing. So you, you can say some knowledge definitely is there, it's a foundation. But if, it, if we simply rely on knowledge only, then as, as the verse said, which I quoted, many lifetimes, after many births, one is actually in knowledge, surrenders to Krishna. And so that takes a long time, it's not very fast. But devotional service can be very quick, very quick. In this one lifetime, Prabhupada wants in this one lifetime we should become perfect. So this process of knowledge is to help us to cultivate the qualities of devotee. Not, just, not that we're just simply cultivating jnana, we're not just simply cultivating knowledge, but this, the qualities which are mentioned here, they're, they're to help us cultivate the real qualities of a devotee. So, this kind of knowledge is very, very important for us. Actually, although there's 20 items, not all of these 20 items are in relation to bhakti. It's explained that the last two items, the last two items are mentioned that uh, set the philosophical search for the Absolute Truth and accepting the importance of self-realization, these do not specifically ap apply to bhakti. But the other items certainly do apply to bhakti. Right? So we said, Amanitvam, Madamvitvam, humility is very important. So Prabhupada, sometimes you can hear Prabhupada speaking very strongly, calling rascal, fool, stupid. This is very good. And just like we saw in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna chastised Arjuna. After Arjuna had surrendered to Krishna, then Krishna said to Arjuna, Oh Arjuna, you're speaking learned words. But you are mourning for, not as what, for what is not worthy of grief. The wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. And so Krishna immediately took the position of the teacher. And the job of the teacher is to find the fault in the student. Right? You don't want to just simply flatter the student. Oh, you are a good student. Oh, you've done so well. No. We want, we want to be, <laughs> we want the, the sternness, the strictness of the teacher, the one who finds the fault. Prabhupada would quote, quote Chanakya Pandit, how Chanakya Pandit said, it's the duty of the father and the guru to find the fault in the son or in the disciple. And if you simply praise them, then they won't work hard. So you, we have to find the fault and that way then get them to work more, work harder, to be more serious. And so we want all of you devotees to take this Bhakti Shastri course very seriously and make great efforts to master the study of the Bhagavad Gita and then you can go on to more things. Prabhupada told one sannyasi devotee, there was one, I remember in Prabhupada's time, there was a one young man, he'd taken sannyas from Prabhupada and Prabhupada told him to go to South India and preach. At that time we had no centers in South India, nothing. 
And so he said, oh Prabhupada, South India, he said, in South India everyone knows Sanskrit. There's so many Sanskrit pundits there. How will I preach there? And Prabhupada told him, he said, you simply have to learn maybe 40 verses from the Bhagavad Gita. If you learn the correct verses from Bhagavad Gita, then you can preach to everyone. And so this Bhakti Shastri course is a very wonderful foundation for training everyone in Krishna consciousness. And it's, uh, Srila, Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada mentions how uh, this should be the preliminary qualification for accepting the second initiation, which is the actual initiation in Krishna consciousness. First initiation you get the name, second initiation is where you get the Gayatri Mantra. So the good qualification to put you in good standing for approaching the spiritual master for second initiation is that you've studied Bhakti Shastri, right? So these qualities are mentioned, first we hear Amanitvam Adamvitvam. And then there's other qualities, ahimsa, and then uh, shantir, arjavam, and then acharyopasanam, acharyopasanam, approaching the acharya, very important. Prabhupada said, everyone needs to have a spiritual master. It's very important. You want to practice bhakti yoga, you have to have a spiritual teacher, you have to take initiation. It's part of the process. It's not just only studying Bhakti Shastri. You have to be guided. And the spiritual teacher is important there to guide us. Without accepting the spiritual teacher, then we haven't really taken, we haven't, we're not following the process properly, correctly. So Acharya Pasanam is required, you must take you must accept a spiritual master. We see Lord Krishna also had a spiritual master and then also Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had a spiritual master and then Srila Prabhupada and Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, they all had spiritual masters. And if, if we think, oh I, I'm different, then it's not good. It's everyone's responsibility, of course, to choose who they want. We don't force anyone who you, want, who you have to take initiation from or when you take initiation. That's your own consideration. But at some point you should do it if you have not already done it. Okay? So this is part of the process of knowledge, accepting the spiritual master and then Going on, come up to, uh, in text number, uh, text number 11. Mayi chan yena bhakti, mayi chan yena yogena bhakti avya vicharini. This is the key part of the process of knowledge. Cultivating pure, unalloyed, Constant devotion for Krishna, very important, that's it, you can say that's the goal of bhakti. Pure unalloyed devotion for Krishna, constant unalloyed devotion. Ananya bhakti, I think you've studied this earlier in the, in the middle portion of the Bhagavad Gita. You've heard a lot about ananya bhakti, so here it's also mentioned it's part of the process of knowledge. So we have to understand the connection here between all of these different items of knowledge. We'll just read a little from the purport here to understand in presenting this. Prabhupada writes in the beginning of the purport, this process of knowledge is sometimes misunderstood by less intelligent men as being the interaction of the field of activity. Interaction of the field of activity. The field of activity meaning the body and the interactions. Well, in the previous verse, if you look back to text 6 and 7, 
you can see what Prabhupada means when he talks about the interactions of the field of activity. He's talking about things like desire, hatred, happiness, distress, these things which come from the mind. These are not part of the process of knowledge. They're something else. You see this? The Prabhupada writes, actually this is a real process of knowledge. If one accepts this process, then the possibility of approaching the Absolute Truth exists. Right? So there are twenty items there, beginning with humility and then approaching the spiritual master and then developing pure unalloyed devotion for him and many other different qualities are discussed. Uh, for example, cleanliness is discussed what cleanliness means. That is, of course, one of the principles of religion. In the Srimad Bhagavatam we read, Dharma, the bull, stands on four legs. Pillars of religion. Someone knows? Someone can tell me? What are the four pillars of religion, of Dharma? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, what is austerity? Uh, austerity is austerity, one. Austerity, yes. cleanliness. Truthfulness, Truth. cleanliness, truthfulness, and uh, compassion. Satyam Shamcham Daya Tapasya. Satyam Socham Daya Tapa. Yes. Daya Tapasya. Yeah, very good. Oh, cleanliness, mercy, austerity, and truthfulness. So, cleanliness is one of the pillars of religion. Cleanliness, Prabhupada would say, the saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. So cleanliness is both internal and external. Its cleanliness is not just only bathing, but it's also cleaning the heart, uh, keeping the heart clean. And we do that particularly by chanting, by regularly chanting. And our chanting should be done with proper care and attention, with real love and concern. Prabhupada was always very concerned that we would keep our temples clean. I remember, very interesting, because Prabhupada was a chemist before he, you know, as a young man, he, he had studied chemistry and then he took a job, he worked in a chemical industry and he had a business even in chemicals at one time. So he quoted a chemical formula which I always remember because I studied the same formula when I was in school. And they, they gave us this, for, they say, a base plus an acid gives salt plus water. And I'm sure all of you who do, have done chemistry, you've heard this formula before. A base plus acid gives salt plus water. Prabhupada said, a base in contact with an acid, there will be reaction. Prabhupada said, in the same way, a brahmana contacts a dirty place, they have to clean it. <laughs> Very wonderful how Prabhupada related the chemical equation to the behavior of the Brahman and to the process of knowledge also because cleanliness is one of these twenty qualities. We have to keep clean and proper cleanliness is cleaning the heart and cleaning also the environment, the dirty places, helping others to be clean, letting them hear the holy name, give them prasadam, give them mercy, try to purify the environment, try to purify the atmosphere with the chanting of the holy name. So this is all part of the process of knowledge. Hmm? Uh, another item which is mentioned is uh, simplicity. Simplicity. Earlier one devotee had quoted that verse, Vidya Vinaya Sampani Brahmani Gavihastini. The Brahman is described as Vidya Vinaya Brahmani. Vidya Vinaya. He's learned and he's also gentle. Or he's 
He's, he's simple. He, he won't hide anything. He'll tell the truth. Right? But he has to speak the truth in such a way that it should be also pleasing. That's also important. Later on we'll discuss more about that in the modes of nature, when we come to the modes of nature. But simplicity. Prabhupada gave the story about the young boy who wanted to enter into the school and the teacher asked him, who's your mother or who's your father? He wanted to know the father because from knowing the father's name he could understand what caste or what kind of like, what behavior the, the young boy would be like. So the, the boy went home and asked his mother, who is my father? And the mother told the boy that, I don't know who is your father. So the boy came back to the school and then he proceeded to tell the teacher, my mother didn't know who is my father. So the teacher immediately understood this boy is very honest. He doesn't tell a lie. You know, usually, you know, if we feel embarrassed about something, we try to hide the truth. But we try to cover up something, we don't want people to know, we don't want to be put into shame. But this young boy was so simple and straightforward, he simply came and said, no, my mother, she doesn't know who is my father. So the teacher immediately said, very good, you can come to school, we will take you as a student. Because the teacher understood this boy is very honest and he's simple, he doesn't try to hide the truth, hide anything. So that's a very good qualification in the process of knowledge. Hmm? Okay, and then uh, there you can read over these 20 qualities. They're very important. It's good to know a few of these qualities. We're going to, we're going to do a little exercise on these qualities. Uh, but first of all, I just want to go over a few more qualities with you. For example, it mentions about freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home and the rest. <laughs> so, freedom from entanglement. We should understand all of these qualities in Krishna consciousness. That uh, oh, I remember one time Srila Prabhupada was in Hong Kong and uh, an Indian gentleman came to Prabhupada and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, I want to take sannyas. So Prabhupada looked at him and said to him, oh, why? Why is it you want to take sannyas? So then the man said, oh, I have a wife and four children at home, it's terrible, I want to get away from them. <laughs> so naturally Prabhupada was not encouraged to give this man sannyas, but he encouraged him to become Krishna conscious. So living with a family, we should live in Krishna consciousness with them. It's not that we should be neglectful. A devotee of Krishna should not be neglectful to his duties in the material world. But at the same time, he has to also remember his spiritual duties. So it's not that we want to simply give up the family. That is not the proper manner. Rather, we live at home and try to encourage the family also in Krishna consciousness. That is proper. Another quality which is mentioned Janma, the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age and disease. Janma Mrityu Jaravyadi. So we certainly can understand these things like birth and death, disease, old age, they're not pleasant, they're difficult, it's painful, different conditions of life. There's so much suffering in the material world. And Srila Prabhupada said, it's very good if we appreciate 
how much suffering is here in the material world, because that will be a good impetus for us towards spiritual life. If we are thinking the world, this material world, to be very pleasant and comfortable, and, oh, I'm having a good time, I'm so happy here, I'm enjoying, then we'll never want to be Krishna conscious. So it's good for us to appreciate, to think about life and to look at it and see what are, is the actual situation here in the world. It's very important for us. We don't want to be too much uh, comfortable. The comfort zone is not very good for us in Krishna consciousness. Rather, we need a little pressure. We see, for example, Queen Kunti. Of course, Queen Kunti went through a lot. She had a lot of problems with her five sons and of being a widow. But she said to Krishna that, Oh, I wish all these calamities would happen again and again. Because the more there are calamities, the more I can remember you. And remembering Krishna means there will be no more birth and death. So this is the idea. Uh, so appreciating the nature of material life, we'll become concerned that we don't want to continue taking birth again and again in this material world. We should be concerned to get out from this material world. If we come back again, in this, we don't know where the next birth will be. You may have a very good night in this life, but next life we don't know. We don't know what the world is going to be like. You don't know where we're going to go. So it's a very precarious, very dangerous situation. We should be very cautious. There's one book, maybe you've read that little book. It's published by our Bhaktivedanta Book Trust. It's called Coming Back, The Science of Reincarnation. And the interesting thing about the book, I think, is the last chapter. Because the last chapter is called Don't Come Back. Right? So that's the idea. If we have cultivated good knowledge, then we'll be very careful not to come back to this material world. Krishna says the same thing in the 8th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The great souls who are yogis in devotion, they never return to this material world. Why? Anyone know? Why don't the great souls return to this material world? Because this is Dukhalayam Maharaj. Yes, thank you. Because they know Dukhalayama Shashvatam, a temporary place of misery. Yeah. So we should follow the examples of these great souls. Okay, I want to draw your attention now to the the final section here in this passage, the last paragraph of this section, Srila Prabhupada writes, Beginning from practicing humility up to the point of realization of the Supreme Truth, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, this process is just like a staircase beginning from the ground floor going up to the top floor. Now, on this staircase, there are so many people who have reached the first floor, the second or the third floor, etc. But unless one reaches the top floor, which is the understanding of Krishna, he is at a lower stage of knowledge. If anyone wants to compete with God and at the same time make advancement in spiritual knowledge, he will be frustrated. It is clearly stated that without humility, understanding is not truly possible. To think oneself God is most 
puffed up. He's a very proud, very arrogant. Although the living entity is always being kicked by the stringent laws of material nature, he still thinks, I am God because of ignorance. Uh, the beginning of knowledge, therefore, is amanitvam, humility. One should be humble and know that he is subordinate to the Supreme Lord. Due to rebellion against the Supreme Lord, one becomes subordinate to material nature. One must know and be convinced of this truth. Okay, so there are 20 qualities mentioned there. Uh, I have an exercise for you on this now. I want to show you... Uh, uh, just one minute. Put. No, no. Okay. Hmm. So what is the purpose? Uh, I've listed here the, the two aims behind this exercise on these verses tonight. First of all, we want you to understand, to have a deeper understanding of these 20 items of knowledge. And then secondly, we want you all to develop moral and academic integrity in the interpretation, evaluation, and application of Shastric knowledge. Now Shastras can be used and abused. Sometimes people may often take the Shastra and use them according to their own purposes. So it's very important for us to be able to recognize how people sometimes misinterpret Shastras. So, what we want you to do tonight, we want you to look through these 20 items of knowledge, not all 20. I want you to select a couple of items yourself and think of ways in which these items of knowledge could be misused or misinterpreted. Right? For example, we said, Acharya Pasanam, you have to approach an Acharya. So how could that be misused? People could think they simply come, they, get, they simply come and somehow or other they get initiation and they never do anything. They never give any service, they never chant even. They just think, well, I'm initiated, I took this. Okay, are we ready? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, yes, so, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. so we'd, we'd like to hear some, some, someone like to offer some explanation, a manner in which one of these items, one item of knowledge, how it could be misused. Maharaj, uh, the detachment can be misused. I'm sorry, Prabhu, could you repeat that, please? Uh, detachment could be misused as, a, uh, an, as an excuse for escaping your responsibilities. Or even uh, um, living in a solitary place. From your responsibilities. Yes, definitely. That I think that's a valid point. And that de detachment, we may uh, go away from our responsibilities, and just by way of detachment. Uh, which particular? How did Prabhupada speak about it in the in the in the purport? Which quality is it in Sanskrit? Uh, 
Is it being without attachment? Asakti, being without attachment. Asakti, okay. Yeah. So you said that could encourage people to be uh, irresponsible, giving up some kind of, maybe they have some dependence or they have some duties in material life and just by way of being detached they want to leave everything. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, yeah. Everyone agree with that? Yes, yes Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, and, and someone else like to offer something? How quality it could yes. be? Yes, Non-violence non can be misused. Yes, can you explain more? Uh, like in this context of the setting of this war, uh, so uh, you cannot apply non-violence here. You need to apply violence in appropriate settings where you have to safeguard the dharma or you have to safeguard the, the right principles. Uh, uh, for example, like also suppose if there is a context of blaspheming of Vaishnavas or our Shastras or um, that actually is for tolerance but um, non-violence cannot be applied in all the settings. We need violence in certain settings to establish the right principles. Okay. And to establish the right righteousness. Srila Prabhupada described violence in his uh, purports here. Even uh, hurting other is violence. Yes. Yes. Prabhupada's yes. way of non-violence is uh, the giving Krishna conscious, bringing people to the Krishna consciousness is actual non-violence. Yes, very good, right. This is real non-violence. When we give people Krishna, and if we don't give them Krishna consciousness, that is violence. <laughs> If we're just giving them mundane knowledge and we're depriving them of Krishna consciousness, that is actual violence. So Prabhupada has a very uh, powerful Krishna conscious definition of violence there. Anything which doesn't give people Krishna consciousness, that is violence. Very good. Okay, some more points. Yes? Cleanliness. Cleanliness only maintained from the outside, but from inside, not removing the dust of uh, anathas. Okay, you're talking about the chanting of holy name? Ch chanting and uh, not keeping attached, you know, uh, removal of all the uh, mental dirt. Mental dirt. Unwanted desires. Material desires. Material desires. Holding on. So a lot of attachments in the course of our chanting. Okay. I have a question. Uh, if we we do have pests and cockroaches and all that in the house, so if we have to end up killing them uh, for cleanliness, would that be amounting to non-violence? <laughs> mm. Yes. Well. These are some of the problems of modern living. You come and live in apartments, you know, and you, you're going to be subjected to these kind of situations. I remember one time in uh, India, there was an incident, there was some yoga and different things. So a devotee said to Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada will put some rat poison down and kill them. And Prabhupada said, you should be killed. So Prabhupada didn't approve, you know, and even in Srimad Bhagavatam, we will find, you can see there in the fifth canto, it describes there's a hellish planet 
for people who kill insects and bed bugs and these kind of things. There's a special hellish planet where they have to go and suffer. So we have to be very careful. It's a very difficult situation. One devotee told me they saw Srila Prabhupada one time and there was a, a, a cock, cockroach came and Prabhupada simply grabbed it and threw it out the window. He said, go outside and enjoy. <laughs> time they were putting up Prabhupada's mosquito net in Bombay at Juhu and there were a lot of mosquitoes so the devotees started swapping, swamp, swamp, uh, using a cloth to swipe them and you know kill them and Prabhupada said why are you making my room into a crematorium and so it, it's, it's not very good but sometimes you know you, it, it, it may be difficult to have to do anything else you may be in a, a, a you know, very difficult situation. It's not very ideal though to kill them and certainly we we'll get reactions for these kind of things. The the idea is you keep you keep everything very clean and they shouldn't come. But of course they do come. You have to just keep cleaning and throw them out, <laughs> throw them out, throw them out. That's better than killing them. Is it okay to use Piff Paff and chant Hare Krishna so that we deliver them? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I don't know, is your chanting of Hare Krishna so powerful that you can deliver them? <laughs> I thought the mantra is powerful. powerful ah. <laughs> I heard one, one past time that Ramanuja Charya had come from, it came from uh, Tirupati and they had some prasadam with them and they walked some distance and when they opened the prasadam, they saw there were some insects in the prasadam. So Ramanuja Acharya immediately said, oh, we have to immediately go back to Turupati. So they turned around and walked all the way back to Turupati and they said, now let these insects go here. Because he said, they have come from Turupati, we shouldn't take them away from the holy place. <laughs> so. He was so conscious, he was so concerned with delivering them that he didn't want to take them away from the holy place. He thought they've taken their birth in the holy place, they should be allowed to leave their bodies in the holy place. He didn't want to be responsible for taking them away. An interesting example. Yeah, we have to see, we have to see Krishna in the heart of all living entities and certainly unnecessary violence is not very ideal, not what we want to do. We know uh, Magrari the hunter wouldn't even step on little insects, they were on its path. So that's a result of powerful chanting. And we see Krishna in all living entities and respect them. So violence we generally, there is proper use of violence, as you pointed out. In the case of the battle, Arjuna should fight the battle. That is proper use of violence according to the order of Lord Krishna. Now, as far as going uh, uh, by way of uh, dealing with insects and, and so many different vermin, so much, they come into our homes and how to keep our home pure, it, it's a problem. It's difficult, we you know. You just try to keep everything clean. That's the main thing. We would get some uh, some kind of oil sometime. I remember one time in uh, I was in New York, I think at the time, and and we had some insects coming on the altar. We got some special oil so that they wouldn't come on the oil on the onto the altar. I can't remember exactly what oil it was. But there was some kind of oil which uh, the insects didn't like, they kept away from. 
So try to find some alternative like that, rather than killing them, because it's non-violence should be one of the qualities which we cultivate, knowledge, one of the twenty items of knowledge, non-violent. Okay, any other, another? Yeah. Now that we know, we will try to avoid uh, killing or snapping the insects, but it's done in ignorance till now, or, by unknow or unknowingly if we have done, how do we, uh, you know, come out of that? You still feel guilty and you have done a mistake. How can we come out of that? Well, the atonement for this is chanting Hare Krishna in devotional service. Yeah, we all, you know, we do something wrong we, or we, you know, we make some mistakes somewhere here and there. So the, 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 the atonement for all of these things is simply devotional service. Take up devotional service, do more chanting, do more uh, service for Krishna. That's the solution. It's a proper way to overcome the reactions from all of these things. Yeah. Now, uh, if do, do we have any more examples from the bodies? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. One of the quality pridelessness uh, can be misused. Uh, like uh, we may possess pridelessness, uh, but we try to compare or comment or judge others by measuring the pride of others. So that itself uh, can be misused in one sense. We, tr we, we measure the pride of others. Yeah. And what? And then what? We, we, try, we want to come up to their pride or... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't get your point. What do we do when we measure the, the other person's pride? How, how should we understand it? Like, we will be uh, poss uh, possessing like, uh, uh, po pridelessness, uh, but we will try to compare or comment or judge others by measuring the uh, pride of uh, others. Uh, like, um, on personal level, Sorry, say again. And can we just hear that again, please? On personal level, we may not have uh, the pridelessness, but comparing with others, that uh, pridelessness can be misused. Oh, you mean other people may be very proud, so we may think it's all right for us to be... Generally, we, 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 have to, we have to look at our own self. It, it doesn't do as much good to look at others. We, we've got to go into our own self and try to cultivate this humility. We see the examples of the Acharyas. For example, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraji says, I am lower than a worm in the stool. He said, anyone who utters, anyone who hears my name, they lose their pious activities. And he said, anybody who chants my name, who utters my name, they become sinful. The only the mercy of Lord Nityananda could deliver such a fallen soul as myself. So that's, uh, oh, that, the, oh, that's uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj speaking like this, describing the mercy of Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda had come to him and told him to leave the home, go to Vrindavan. So Prabhupada said, when he wrote like that in his Chaitanya Charitamrita, he said, he actually felt it. He wasn't just saying it. 
You know, sometimes we may speak, oh, I'm so fallen, I'm the most fallen. Actually, one time a devotee said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I'm the most fallen. But Prabhupada said to him, you are not the most anything. <laughs> because Prabhupada understood the mentality of the devotees, you know, that we want to be the most, you know, we always want to be the most of something. Even when we talk about being fallen, I'm the most fallen, I'm the most. In, but Prabhupada, so in this way Prabhupada was correcting us how we have to be humble. We have to really think of ourselves as very low and insignificant. We see also Narakur in his song, you know, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Dayakara Mori, that he says, uh, Ha Prabhu Nityananda Premananda. No, he said, uh, Dayakara, how does it go? Mosamo Patita Prabhu Napa Ibi Ara, right? Yeah, that Lord Chaitanya is Patita Pavan. He came to deliver all the fallen souls. So Narutam said, I'm, my claim is I'm the most fallen. <laughs> so like that, this, this, this humility. We, we want to see these people as our guidelines in humility. Think like in terms of humility and how we can be humble in dealing with other devotees by simply respecting them. We have the etiquette when we meet people, please accept my humble obeisances. As Prabhu, Prabhu meaning master. So we think of ourselves as servant, you're the master. So in this way, people uh, just, just In, in this way, people have to cultivate humility. Seeing others as a master, I'm the servant, be the servant, the servant. Because that's our spiritual position, right? Some other Tolerance. Yes. How, tolerance. How, tolerance. how could how it could be abused? Uh, tolerance is uh, I mean uh, to bear the insults or dishonor that is meant towards us. But if you miss the other version of us, then that will be misused or misunderstood. Okay, you have to you have to give me again. I'm I'm not able to catch everything. It's not so clear. So uh, tolerance is meant to bear the insults or dishonor, which is uh, uh, supposedly towards us. So if we are insulted, we are we are meant to bear it. That is tolerance. But if we misunderstand it and we continue to tolerate insults towards Krishna or other Vaishnavas, then that is basically kind of misuse or misunderstood. All right. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, we can tolerate offensive, we can tolerate uh, abuse of our own self, but we should not tolerate to hear the abuse or offenses against Krishna and against the senior Vaishnavas, right? Okay, good. Uh, simplicity, Maharaj. Yes? For example, be, uh, being simple, wearing tilaka and everything, uh, and uh, still having mentality to do politics among the devotees. <laughs> yeah. yeah, somebody may be in the dress of the Vaishnava, but it doesn't mean that he's so pure and simple and straightforward if he's talking politics. So, of course, that is prajalpa. And prajalpa is one of the things which lead to spiritual fall down. By talking nonsense, then we start to get more nonsense thoughts and nonsense ideas, nonsense actions. And then again, another birth in the material world. So we have to be conscious of not only just simply looking like a devotee, 
but actually behaving like a devotee, right? We, we say uh, sato vrite, cultivating the proper behavior. You know, yenagata sapanta, follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans, the great devotees. We don't want to be just caught in politics, politicking. So Lord Chaitanya Taniya Sadahari, always chant the holy name. That is the important thing. That is the real guide to success. If we keep the holy name on our tongue, how to recognize a devotee is not just by the appearance, but they have to actually show the nature of the devotee. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was asked how to recognize a devotee, and Mahaprabhu said, Asat Sangha Tyag E Vaishnava Achar, Stri Sangha Eka Sadhu Krishna Bhakti Ar. The nature of the devotee is that they give up the association of the asat. But the, this is not right. Oh, this, that, oh, so many things. Prabhupada was never happy to hear the devotees give a lot of complaints. Prabhupada liked when the devotees would praise and they would talk good about the devotees. But when people wrote to Prabhupada complaining about this and this is not right and this devotee did that and so many things and all the politics, they don't want to hear. Lord Gramyakata, the village talk. Village, in the village, you know, in the village, people come together, they just gossip. It's all prajalpa. So he told Ragnar, never hear these things and talk with this, in, in this, like this. So it's very important for us also to keep our Krishna consciousness. If people are talking politics, better to just uh, chant the holy name. Just say, I'm sorry, I have to do my japa. I run away. Right? Don't stand and listen. Don't get involved in politics. detachment from home. Uh, so usually we've seen that um, uh, in uh, among the devotees, they, uh, especially the newly married couples, they think they need that detachment. Our children are burdened for their spiritual practice, so they think not to get children and to be. They, uh, so therefore, it should not be misunderstood that detachment is uh, not to have children or not to pay attention to family but to uh, commentary on this uh, passage uh, about how to make a home a sweet home. Mm -hmm. So Asaktihi should not be uh, misused for not developing the family uh, uh, or not pay attention to the family. Okay, yeah very nice. Yeah. Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Instruction that uh, we need many children for our Krishna Consciousness Movement. And, and of course, the, the proper parents of Krishna conscious, uh, when you have a, a mother, then they're the ideal parents to give birth to Krishna conscious children. And of course, giving birth to Krishna conscious children is both religious and legal. It's authorized in the scriptures because they're the future devotees. So very important, yeah, young couple get married, while they're young, they should have the children, because when they get old, it'll be very difficult, very difficult for older people to have children. Sometimes we see that people, they wait till they're better, that in, uh, earlier in their life they plan to have children, and then they can raise their children to become Krishna conscious. Very important. The children in our movement, to give them a good training, good education and they can grow and grow up to be nice devotees. So I'm always anxious to see nice children, like to see children taking an interest in Krishna consciousness. I think it's very important for our movement. So yes, thank you Madhiji, very nice point. Anybody else out there? Detachment from general people, Maharaj. Detachment, Detachment from the general people, yes. 
it means that we should not imbibe their uh, habit or their quality or to listen to their uh, village struggle as you say but then it can be misinterpreted as not going to the people to bring them to krishna consciousness because chaitanya mahaprabhu said jare dekho tare kaho krishna upadesh means whomever i see i have to give try to bring them in krishna consciousness so if i am not going to in between them among them then i cannot bring them to krishna consciousness Mm. Yeah, okay, very good, yeah. We don't want to isolate ourselves from the general people. We do have to... At the same time, we like to live in the association of devotees. We don't like to, you know, have to be surrounded by a lot, a lot of people who are not devotees. Then it can be quite difficult for us. All right. Is there any uh, any more points there? Yes. So I asked him to live alone in another point. Neophyte devotees after hearing this may leave the devotees association. But in the Chaitanya Charitamrita said that we need association of sadhus, and then only we can elevate ourselves. We can't just isolate ourselves, uh, thinking that after Krishna says this, we must isolate ourselves. Interesting. Prabhupada says. Uh, he writes here in that, in relation to this, he said, uh, uh, One may test himself by seeing how far he is inclined to live in a solitary place without unwanted association. So Prabhupada writes like that, it's like a test for us, that you, if you go into that kind of place, you have to live uh, in a solitary place. Are you able to remain Krishna conscious and not to, are you able to stay Krishna conscious and not to be deviated because you're, you're on your own. And we saw, for example, in Srimad Bhagavatam, the example is there how Bharat Maharaj went to the mountains and he became attached to a deer. Now Bharat Maharaj was already a greatly advanced devotee, but somehow he got attached to a deer. So that example is there in Srimad Bhagavatam to warn us how you have to be very careful. So Prabhupada said, you, you'd have to, one may test oneself to see how far we're inclined to live in a solitary place without unwanted association. Because although in the beginning we may not want association, somehow in the course of time when you're living there alone, just like Bharat Maharaj, he was alone and he got a family and you're intending being alone, but you get into, you get some other kind of association. Just like people have a lot of associ association these days, mobile phones, computers, or sometimes you get cars, you associate with these things. You have to be very careful not to become too attached to these things. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Um, I have one more point, uh, like in relation to the renunciation of sense gratification. So we, it can also be kind of misused because like nowadays we do need um, uh, these appliances like laptops, or phones to connect ourselves to other devotees and other Vaishnavas. For example, in the present times, um, when we are all locked down, we need these appliances to connect and establish our spiritual uh, uh, work on our spiritual path. So what I'm saying, like, it's a term used is Yukta Vairagyam. So, I mean, instead of Palgu Vairagyam, we should be having Yukta Vairagya approach using these um, appliances in the service of uh, Vaishnavas and Krishna would be uh, appropriate. Okay. And what would be the wrong application? Using it for us, our own sense gratification, uh, I mean, looking at things which are not um, Krishna conscious, which are not pleasing to Krishna. Yes. Um, uh, that would be a wrong use. That it, it's a very serious problem. Yes, true. <laughs> and I think so, so. We have to understand that. So many 
parents often tell me how they're, they're very worried about their child, that they play on the mobile phone, they have some games and different things that are there within the, within the mobile phone, and it occupies a lot of time. It's a very dangerous thing, isn't it? You know, that you, you want to use something for the service of Krishna, but at the same time, it, 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 there's all, it, it's a very fine line between Krishna's service and getting into Maya. You have to be very careful. So, you so we need to develop self-control and discipline. Uh, that is very important and a very, um, um, very fine understanding of what is wrong and what is right. Uh, these things come with maturity and practice of knowledge from the right people, from our gurus, from our, um, our senior acharyas and uh, other devotees who are practicing serious questions. Yes, yeah, you're right. The, the proper education and training has, has to be there. If the if people are from the beginning, if they're brought up to understand what is the proper thing, what is the proper use of these things, then they'll use them the proper way. And just like young children, you know, that when you, can, you bring them up you know, not to eat things like cakes and biscuits because they have eggs in. They know if you purchase outside in some bakery the, their cake and bread and so on, they're often with eggs. And so you train the children, no, we don't eat these things because they, they have eggs for them, we don't want to eat eggs. So the child is trained from young. They know, we, we, I don't eat this. In a similar way, we have to train the children what, how to use things like mobile phones and computers and so on. And it comes a lot by our own example and also by good association. We have to get good association and see how things are used properly. But it's, it's a great challenge because especially young children growing up in the world and they, they, they go to school and they associate with other children there and, you know, a little bad association and it's, you know, it's highly contagious. Just like this virus which is going around is highly contagious. And so similarly, this kind of association, materialistic association, it's highly contagious, spreads very fast. You can see, it didn't take very long for everyone to learn how to use a mobile phone and how to use it and how to play the games and so on. It's a very deep-rooted contamination. We have to be careful. So thank you, Manaji. Yeah, very nice points. Anybody else? Maybe? Yes. Yes, Maharaj, humility in the sense of yeah, neophyte devotees, you know, may end up with the, you know, the taking so seriously humility. And, uh, uh, you know, we work in the office with different uh, kind of, uh, you know, our seniors. We, if we are, you know, so in uh, taken seriously the humility, we may end up with losing job or, you know, they may treat us in a different way. And even in office, other environment. So we have to maintain that standard you know, how uh, we have to uh, act on a different uh, time, place and circumstances. Okay. Yes, yeah, certainly. Time, place and circumstances. In the association of materialistic people, you don't want to put on a show of humility. <laughs> it may be taken the wrong yes. way. Yeah, can be taken the yes. wrong way. So there's a time and place for everything. But... Uh, yeah, in the modern world, yes, in the modern world, in the corporation industry, uh, people don't have much uh, appreciation for humility, <laughs> spiritual qualities. But these kind of things can be internalized in such association. That inter although externally you may exp you, you may appear different internally we should always maintain that consciousness that internally i know i'm a soul 
and I'm just acting the drama along with them because of this work. So, don't be too much affected by their association. Internally, we should keep that spiritual consciousness. Just like externally, you know, they will talk about being, you know, being aggressive and planning to get more results and producing more profit margins. And we should, you know, we'll go along with it. Yes, this is, you know, we have to do this and like that. And we can put on an act like that. But inside, internally, we should be thinking, I'm the servant of Krishna and I'm working under Krishna's direction and it's all going on under the nature. And we'll try to please Krishna. So, you have to try to keep Krishna consciousness. You work in a job. It's not that you want to be completely uh, into the material atmosphere. You have to keep your spiritual consciousness at the same time. But you just have to disguise it or co cover it up. You don't reveal it. You don't exhibit it in others. Hmm? Okay, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to something which Prabhupada writes here in the text. It's coming, it comes in, uh, in relation to the approaching the spiritual master. First they talk about simplicity. The paragraph begins with simplicity. It's, it's, uh, it's about two pages through the purport, Prabhupada's writing about simplicity and then he writes about accepting the spiritual master. He said, it is essential because without the instruction of a bona fide spiritual master, one cannot progress in the spiritual science. One should approach the spiritual master with all humility and offer him all services so that he will be pleased to bestow his blessings upon the disciple. Because a bona fide spiritual master is a representative of Krishna, if he bestows any blessings upon his disciple, that will make the disciple immediately advance without the disciple following the regulative principles. So this is a very interesting statement here. Prabhupada says. I'll read it again. That will make the disciple immediately advanced without the disciples following the regulative principles. Or the regulative principles will be easier for one who has served the spiritual master without reservation. <laughs> so we have to be a little care careful about reading something like that. Because someone may read this and they may think, well, if I get the blessing, and they could use this, you see, Prabhupada says, without the disciple following the regulative principles, they are immediately advanced simply by the Guru's blessings. <laughs> so we should not take this uh, the wrong way. We may think, oh, Guru, bless me. I don't need to follow regulative principles. The blessings are there. But with the blessings, Prabhupada, of course, qualified it in the second sentence. He said, the, the regulative principles will be easier who has served the spiritual master without reservation. So when the spiritual master gives blessings to the disciple, they may not be following regulative principles, but because he is encouraging them, they may start to follow the regulative principle. They should. They should think that I'm so fallen, the spiritual master's given me mercy, he's helping me, now I have to become more serious. I really have to can't cheat any longer because Guru Maharaj has given me blessings, so I should take advantage. I have to really improve my conduct and do better and keep the principles. Master, that we will follow the regulative principles, not that we'll deviate from them. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else there who would still like to contribute something? Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes? Uh, please, I apologize for my naivety, but, but uh, I can't exactly differentiate between humility and pridelessness as two qualities. Aren't they related? I mean, if you lack pride, then you are humble, and for being humble, it means you have pridelessness. So how do I differentiate these as two qualities? I mean, they are there, of course, so I just understand um, how do I really infer this um, since they are mentioned as two separate well I, I could I, I, I would try to think of it like this that a humility could be more the internal quality that one's own internal nature and pridelessness is working with others okay Maharaj okay all right when we are, you know, working along with, 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 with other people like that. So one, one is internal and the other is more external in actions and so on. And both, so both internal and external, as far as we go ourselves personally as an individual and others, both ways we want to be humble and be without pride. Very certainly, the, Prabhupada doesn't really give a clear distinction between them, but uh, there's certainly, as you say, it's two qualities. And there's humility is in relation to our own self, and pride is working, you know, alongside others the tendency. Hmm? Thank you, Maharaj. Looking for... Hmm. Well, Prabhupada describes... Thank you, Maharaj. Yes? Uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, you just mentioned that if Guru's uh, mercy is there, then the disciple can follow the regulative principles. But let's say, uh, Maharaj, if the disciple is not following regulative principles nicely, so in that case, will the disciple be able to follow Guru's instructions, like other specific instructions? Is it possible? It, it may be possible for some time, but it won't last for very long. If they're not following the regulative principles, uh, but they're doing something, some kind of service for the Guru. We don't know how long that they can go on doing that because they're not following, they're not strictly following right principles. So after some time, because they're not strictly following the regulative principles, they, they, will, they will just drift away from the service of the spiritual master. Although they may do a little service for some time, they won't because they're not, not keeping up the, the proper standard. So within their heart, they know that they're not doing it right. So they'll feel guilty. They'll feel, they'll feel guilty or they just, they won't even care at all. And they just won't even, if they may, they may feel guilty, they don't want to come, they just stop coming at all. They don't come near. So like that, they, they give up Krishna consciousness. Just like there was one devotee, he was a very senior man and he was actually like a sannyasi and he was in charge of a temple and he was building a temple there. And, but he was building the temple, he wasn't chanting. And so they told Srila Prabhupada, they, they said, Prabhupada, he, he's building the temple but he doesn't chant his rounds. And they said the reason why he doesn't chant his rounds is because he said he's too busy to chant his rounds. So Prabhupada said, then it will just be a question of time before he gives up Krishna consciousness. And so it was like that. After some time, after the temple was built, the person who built the temple, he just silently disappeared, he just went away, got off into some other things, you know, and disappeared for a long time. And then after many, many years, then he came back. And sometimes we see him around, you know but not very active really in Krishna consciousness. 
So that's the problem. The, we're sentimentally, we're sentimental about it, we're not strict. So after some time, because of the offenses, because we're engaging in activities away from Krishna consciousness, then we lose the taste for the association of devotees and we stop coming. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any other questions there? Anybody else wanted to contribute? So we've spoken about the 20 items of knowledge. Uh, we've explained the most, uh, the, the foundation is a humility and uh, pridelessness, and then the importance of approaching the spiritual master, and then also constant and pure devotional service is uh, there at the top. That's at the Prabhupada said that was the top of the building. Mm. Pridelessness, humility is the beginning. Then come to the spiritual master and go up up the staircase and the top floor is pure devotional service. Now I'll just read a little bit from the, the first paragraph there of the purport of the sex. Prabhupada writes in the first paragraph, Maya Chanyena Yogena Bhakti Ravya Bicharini, the process of knowledge terminates in unalloyed devotional service to the Lord. So if one does not approach or is not able to approach the transcendental service of the Lord, then the other 19 items are of no particular value. But if one takes to devotional service in full Krishna consciousness, the other 19 items automatically develop within him. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Yashyasti Bhaktir Bhagavati Akinchana Sarvayar Gunaistatra Samase Asuraha All the good qualities of knowledge develop in one who has attained the stage of devotional service. The principle of accepting a spiritual master, as mentioned in the 8th verse, is essential. Even for one who takes the devotional service, it is most important. Transcendental life begins when one accepts a spiritual master, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, clearly states here that this process of knowledge is actual path. Anything speculated beyond this is nonsense. <laughs> so, very clear. Hmm? There's nothing beyond these 20 items. Oh my God. 